Well folks, I'm at Nunnington Hall in North Yorkshire and I've spotted some pear trees and lots of windfall pears just going to waste. So I think I'm going to make some Nunnington Hall pear perry. Why not? Just need a couple of kilos. Oh, they're fine. If anyone says anything, I'll just say I've got a big dog. Good morning from the kitchen, folks. It's a chilly November morning. It's the next day from when I got the pears. Let's have a look at them. Here they are. They're in the sink. They're looking quite nice. They've been soaking overnight, just in case there are any bugs, etc. on them. I'm going to get them out now and weigh them. OK, I've just got them out of the sink. I reckon I might have three kilos. I'll weigh them in a sec. They're rock hard though, so they definitely need breaking down with steam. But does anyone know what variety that is? Somebody said yesterday to me at Winchester while I was uh, picking them up, but I'm not so sure if they are. But if anyone has any clue, I'd be very pleased uh, if you could let me know. Thank you. So it turns out I've got 5,892 grams of pears. In other words, six kilos of pears, which is double what I thought I had. But this is still great news. I'm going to make some very decent perry from these. Right, I've got my big chopper out and now I need to cut my pears into two. Quite a challenge because they are tough like that, but I'm just halving them. And then those halves are going to go into this pan and I've got to repeat that process until the pan is full. Okay, that's the first pan load done. I'm going to add a bit of water now into the bottom. So we get some gas on. I turn that down to low. And then I want to put the pears on that ring. And I want that to come to a very, very gentle simmer and steam. So the idea is that the steam that will build up in there will break down the pears because they are too hard at the minute. It will make them soft so that I can push them through a sieve. So I've got a few more pears here to do that with. You don't need to watch me repeat the process. So I'll come back to you in a bit. Okay, I've got two pans of pears on the stove. I'll come back to you when they've been steaming for a bit. Okay, I've turned these off now. They've been in a good couple of hours actually. But you can see that they've gone nice and mushy and they've released a ton of juice into that water. I'm going to let these cool and then they're going to get pushed through a sieve. Good morning from the very chilly kitchen folks. It's actually only four degrees outside, hence I'm wrapped up pretty well in this film. Um, I didn't actually get a chance to do anything else with the pears yesterday, so this is day two of the brew process. Let's have a look at those pears. So you may be able to hear the gas and that is because I've had to put this one back on because these are still a little bit too hard. But the ones in this pan seem quite mashable. So I'm just gonna test that theory out. And yet yeah, they seem to be mashing okay with the potato masher. And you can see that the water is really syrupy. And that is what we want for this brew. So I'm just going to give these a little bit of a mash. And then I'll come back to you for the next bit. Okay, these pears have mashed nicely. So the next step in the process is to spoon them out of here into this sieve. And then using that wooden spoon, push them through the sieve so I get all the pulp and all the hard stuff and the stalks and bits stay behind in the sieve. So here's the sieve and I'm just going to spoon some in and you can see and hear it dripping through which is good that's all the good stuff that we're going to ferment. Right okay now it's simply a case of spoon and work it, work that magic, get all that good stuff through there. Right, this is going to take a little while, I've got plenty to do here, so once I've done this pan load I'll show you what the net result is and we'll take it from there. See you in a bit. Okay, one empty pan and one wok of apple puree and some rubbish for the garden. 
Okay, I've got to wait to do these later today. So these are going to have to come to a bit of a simmer before they're mushable. So what I'm going to do with this is just simply put the lid on for now. And I shall come back to it later on. So I'll see you in a bit and I'll get this on the garden for compost first. Just working my way through the big pan. Well, that took some doing, but I've got there. Right, so that's the rubbish, which is gonna go on the garden as compost. And this is the good stuff in there. Okay, so the stuff that I've got in the big pan, I want to break the fibers down even further. I'm gonna do that by bringing it to a simmer. However, it's such a thick liquid at the minute that if I bring it to the simmer in this pan, it will burn to the bottom. So with that said, I'm gonna add two liters of spring water. And I shan't be adding any more water to it after this, hopefully. And I'm hoping that I get a gallon out of this for a demijohn ferment. As you can see, that's not too bad. And I should have enough for a, a gallon demijohn ferment in there. I'm gonna put the gas on low. And I want this to come to a gentle simmer. No rushing it. This is gonna take some time. I'll come back to you when it's simmering. Okay, we can see it's beginning to come to a simmer now. I'm gonna leave it for five minutes and then I wanna turn it off again. Okay, I'm definitely switching that off now. And I'm gonna leave that to cool down for a good hour before going to the next step. Right, it's all happening. I'm just gonna transfer it into this pan now from the big pan that's on the saucepan. Okay, I'm gonna transfer with a glass jug to begin with, just because the pan's really heavy. And it's obviously hot and steamy, as you can see, even after leaving it, the pan retains a lot of heat. Dramatic pour. Not so dramatic, thankfully. Oh, that's good. That's worked nicely. Okay, I can leave this pan as it is. So on the big pan, I'm gonna rest this colander, which fits over there nicely, which is why I transferred it back out of this pan so I could use this one again for that reason. And then over the colander, I'm gonna drape this muslin cloth. So this is how this currently looks, and this will keep all the solid matter and all the liquid will drip through into the pan. That's the theory anyway. Let's see what happens. So you can hear that straight away. I've really emptied this pan and this is what this currently looks like now. I'm going to put the lid on for 10 minutes to keep any contaminants out. That'll drain through some more, then I'll be able to get the rest in. I'll do that and then I'll come back to you in a little bit to show you what it's beginning to look like. See you soon. Okay, it's been a few hours. Let's have a look at that pear cake. And there you go. So this is the pear puree which has drained of the liquid. The liquid is underneath. I won't lift the, the colander to reveal that because it's gonna disturb the muslin cloth, which is doing quite a good job at the minute. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave this overnight and then I'm gonna conclude this recipe tomorrow by getting the liquid in the demijohn, adding the yeast and starting off the fermentation. So I'll catch you tomorrow. Actually, I'm back. Just one more bit of film actually, because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press this overnight. And I'm gonna do that by placing this bowl inside the colander and pushing it downwards. And then I'm gonna add weight onto the bowl via that two liters of water, which will keep pressing it. And that will extract as much liquid as possible out of the pulp. So I will see you tomorrow. Hey folks, it's finally time to put this together and make that perry. Let's have a look inside the pan.
So here is the bowl on top of the pear puree mush. I'm just trying to lever this up. See, it's really stuck actually. So I'm just lifting the bowl off the pear puree mush and the mush has attached itself completely to the bowl. I've never seen it do that before. That's quite bizarre. I feel like this is art. Anyway, let's have a look inside the pan now properly. And there is our liquid. So I'm going to take the original gravity of this liquid just to see where I'm at before I add any sugars to it. Very, very carefully. Hydrometer goes in. So I'm looking at about 1.030 before I add any sugar to this, but I do want to add some sugar into this because I'd like to get that closer to 1.050. So my fermenting vessel of choice today is the good old Glass Warhorse Demijohn, 1970s boot special. Um, so I'm going to ferment in this and I want to find out how much liquid I've actually got before I decide about how much spring water, how much brew sugar, etc. I need to add to it. And I'm going to follow that with what's in the big pan. Hopefully not making too much mess. So I can see that I've literally got just over a gallon or just over five litres of must. Now, I haven't got enough to split this into two demijohns, it would reduce the flavour too much. So the bit that's left in the pan here, I'm going to bottle and I'll make some pear cordial with it separately. So I'm going to take some of the must out of the demijohn and I'm going to dissolve some brew sugar in it before adding it back into the demijohn. So I'm just going to pour a little bit out of here, maybe a litre or so. That will do. I'm going to add some heat. Let's get that brew sugar. So I'm just going to weigh out 300 grams of brewing sugar, maybe just over. What have we got there? There's 320 grams, that will do. So I'm going to add this into the pear must and just give it a little stir. I won't need to add too much heat to this. It won't need to come to a boil. The brew sugar does dissolve quite easily. Okay, the brew sugar has dissolved in the pear liquid. I'm going to pour that back in. I know it's red hot, but it doesn't matter. The demijohn's well protected by what's already in there. And yeah, I'm not worried about overfilling my demijohn. I don't get scared about things like that. Okay, that's all in there. So what I'm going to do is leave that like that. I'm going to let this cool down for a little bit because it's now above room temperature overall and it needs to cool for me to take the gravity. So I'll come back in an hour or so when that's cooled down. In the meantime, I better deal with this. Okay, it's been a couple of hours. The pear is now at room temperature. Here it is. So once again, I'm just going to remove some to take the original gravity and this time I'm not going to pour that back in and that will leave me a little bit of headspace for the Krausen. It might still flood out, but if it does, it does. Okay, in goes the hydrometer. That's spot on. That's just what I wanted. And you know what? I have finished on an original gravity of 1.052, 1052. That wasn't bad for guesswork, was it? So I'll have a cheeky nifter of the must. Just tastes really like pears. Tinned pears. Hopefully this will be a good one. So it's now time to add my dry ingredients. So I'll put a fresh funnel in there. The first thing I'm going to add is a generous heap teaspoonful of pectolase. And this may or may not work, but I'm trying to achieve as clear a final product as possible. And because I've boiled the pears, 
then there's going to be some pectin in there. I'm kind of hoping that the pectolase will help to make this less cloudy and less hazy because of that pectin. Uh, it might not work and if it doesn't, I'm not worried. I don't mind drinking a cloudy drink, it's not the end of the world is it? My yeast of choice today is 71B. So I'm going to get a level teaspoonful and then on top of that a third of a level teaspoonful and I'm just going to shake that in there through the funnel. I'm not going to swish it around, I'm going to let it sit on top and work its way in naturally. Okay, so I've got my airlock in, I've labelled the demijohn, Perry, today's date and the original gravity of 1.052. My chalk pen seems to be on its last legs. Um, what I'm actually going to do is move this into my living room and then I'll come back to you with a fermentation update once it begins. I'm moving it into my living room simply because it's warmer in there. We have the fire on 12 hours a day, so it's a nice warm room for fermenting. I'll catch you in a bit. Okay, it is brew day two and fermentation has begun. As you can see, we have a Krausen which has formed. It's still very early days and very slow. I'm only getting maybe a bubble every 40 seconds or something like that, but it is happening. Big brother behind there, he's currently brewing a beer. But yeah, Perry is looking okay. Okay, it's brew day three on the Perry. And we've had the crazy stage overnight. We've had a little eruption into the airlock, nothing dramatic. Better sort this out. So I've just moved it into the kitchen and I'll give it a little clean. Nice and straightforward. Like I say, it's no problem. Rinse it out with this. Yeah, there's a bit of smeg in the airlock. Hopefully it'll come through and wash out. If it doesn't, it don't matter. So just looking inside there now, you can see that it has sank again. So it could erupt again, it, it can happen, but if it does, it does. And I'll just clean the airlock again. There we go. Good morning from the kitchen folks. It is my Perry bottling day. This is, I believe, brew day 124. If I'm wrong, I'll correct it as a subheading, but let's have a look at that Perry, which you will see from the findings is still absolutely beautifully clear. So today I want to get it out of there and into these bottles. Now, because I've used finings, there's a very good chance that my Perry won't sparkle because the yeast has been dragged to the bottom and it's not going to go into my bottles. But I'm going to hope and cross my fingers that I might just be able to get a little bit of effervescence or a fizz. So in order to achieve any kind of fizz, I need to add a little bit of sugar to the bottles. This is just normal household granulated sugar. And I'm going to put about that much in each bottle, which would represent um, a level teaspoonful and these are 750 ml bottles so if there is any yeast left in there when it finds this sugar it will instinctively try and break it apart and in doing so carbon dioxide is produced that builds up in the bottle as pressure and that's what should give it the sparkle fingers crossed so I need to take the bung out of the demijohn I need to insert the siphoning tube so I don't disturb the sediment at the bottom. I've got this clip on the top which holds it steadily in place. There we go. And you can see that the bottom of the tube is there. That's where the sediment is. I need to get this just above the sediment line. And the first bit that comes out will be sedimentary, but that's going to go into my hydrometer tube. Right, let's get sucking. So first bit into the hydrometer tube, it's a bit murky to begin with, it's cleared up nicely and now I'm going into the, uh, I'm going everywhere, I don't know, I'm trying to multitask you see, and as a man I'm not right good at that, but anyway, so it's going in okay now, I am picking up a tiny bit of sediment, which is not good in terms of clarity, but it might mean that I get a little bit of fizz because it might be picking a bit of yeast up with it. 
So, yeah, I would rather, I didn't pick any sediment open. In fact, I'm not doing now. It was just in the first phase. So this bottle might end up a bit sedimenty and we can already see a bit of action. Jackson there. And into bottle number three. Now I suspect I'm going to have enough for five and a half bottles and if that is the case then my final bottle will be replaced with this one but I'll wait and see first. To bottle number five. Yeah, there is definite some reaction going on there, so I think I might end up with a sparkler here looking at this. Yeah, this is only going to be five bottles actually. I don't even think I'm going to get anywhere near the top of this one. And there we go, bubbles in the siphoning tube tell me that that process is over. So this is what I've got. I've got five full bottles and I've got this which I've now poured into the smaller bottle. I could try topping it up with what's in the hydrometer tube but I know that's going to be really murky. So I think I'm just going to use this as a sampler and have a go at this tonight as it is. So because each of my five bottles is going to build up pressure if it sparkles hopefully they need to be bunged and caged. So these are the bungs, the plastic bungs which have been softening in very hot water. And with each of the bungs, it's simply a case of pressing it into the bottle, like so, and getting a metal cage to hold it into place. Otherwise, without the metal cage, the bung soon becomes a missile. So I need to twist the metal cage into place. There we go. Right, lovely. So that's bottle number one done. I bung and cage the others in exactly the same way. You don't need to see that. I'll come back to you when they're all done. So that's all my bottles bunged and caged. I'm just giving them a quick shower to get any sticky residue off of the outside. I'll leave them to dry before labelling. But before I can make my labels, I need to take the final gravity reading so I can work out the alcohol by volume for this brew. So I've got my 100ml sample in the hydrometer flask. Hydrometer goes in. And let's have a look where we've finished. I'm quite surprised to tell you that it's finished higher than I expected actually. I'm used to this being 1.000 or less and this has been months so I know it's fermented out but it's actually finished on 1.005 just in between the 4 and the 6 1.005 Okay, let's work out the alcohol by volume then. Okay, so I began with an original gravity of 1.052. I deduct from that the final gravity of 1.005 and that equals 0.047. And then I multiply this by 131.25 and that gives me a final alcohol by volume of 6.16875%. Let's just say 6.2% because if I do get a fractional fermentation in there from the cabin, then that will increase ever so slightly. I'm more than happy at 6.2%. It's a nice percentage for a Perry. It's not rocket fuel, but it should be something that's quite sessionable and quite drinkable, especially on a summer's afternoon in the garden. So yeah, I'm happy with that. Anyway, let's have a cheeky nifter out the hydrometer tube, see what it's like. It smells very nice, quite cidery, quite whiny. I can't really think what a perry should smell like. It's been so long since I've had one. Oh, that's nice. It's not too dry either. I think after this is conditioned, this is going to be a really delicious drink. I'm definitely going scrumping for pears again this year. So I've made a very simple label on my mobile phone. It's for a Fomimo Bluetooth printer. There's the model if you want to see what sort it is. Just a little gadget bought from Amazon. I'm going to print the label five times. And there we go. E, it's right, posh. Now it's just a case of labelling my bottles, which when you've got textured glass like this can be easier said than done. Although hopefully that'll sit there and look reasonable. That's one done. Et voila. I'll come back to you in a sec. And there they are. 
like the famous five. Okay, welcome to the living room. This is where my Perry is going to condition on top of my drinks cabinet. The temperature up there is currently 18.7 and that will get warmer because this is a south facing room. It's only April and the sunshine on the conservatory and warming it up nicely in here. So the conditioning process is what will allow the sparkle to develop if there's any yeast left in the bottle. Once it finds that sugar, smashes it apart, fractional fermentation, creation of CO2, pressure builds up, sparkle develops, that's the plan. But also the flavour will develop over time. And the sample tasted quite nice, so I'm really, really hopeful for this one. Big fingers crossed. I'm probably going to open the first bottle in about six weeks time to see how it's turned out. So I'll catch you then. See you later, folks. <music> From the kitchen folks at long last it is my perry grand opening night it's brew day 162 this has been in production for getting on for half a year pretty much i don't know what i'm going to get out of this i'm really hoping i'm going to get a sparkle i'm really hoping i'm going to get a nice flavor but i just don't know let's find out so this cage is getting a bit sharp it's definitely near the end of its life. I might get one more out of it. I might take that off gently. So what I'm wanting to get from this is something that sparkles, something that looks good in the glass, something that smells nice and something that tastes nice. It doesn't look too bad in the bottle. There's a very fine sediment layer. And if I take my finger away from the bung, the eagle-eyed amongst you might notice it's raised by about half a millimetre. That's possibly a good sign, or it's possibly a red herring. Let's find out. Okay, am I going to get a pop? Oh, yes, I got a bit of a pop. It wasn't a mad pop, but it was a bit of a pop. But there was a tiny bit of vapour, and I can see bubbles rushing to the top. And when I say rushing, I mean in a genteel way. Something's going on. Okay, so let's have a look at this. It's got a sparkle. It's not a massive sparkle, but it's a sparkle. I think we can all agree. I have a sparkle. That makes me happy. Right. Oh. Now, we can see bubbles. It looks good in the glass. It smells very dry, drier than I expected actually. It smells like, um, and there is a pairness to it. Notice I said pairness there. So if you're watching this on subtitles, make sure that the subtitles got the right word. Okay. Pairness. Hmm. <sighs> What's it going to taste like? That is lovely. Seriously. Very medium. Very pear flavoured. Wow. That is one of the nicest brews I've made for a while. I mean, it's been a while since I've done a brew film. So yeah, I'm glad that we've got a good one here. The very delicate sparkle actually is a bonus because sometimes the sparkle can be a bit too much and it detracts from the flavour. The texture on your tongue with a heavy sparkle sometimes makes you lose what the flavour actually is. This I'm fully getting and it is so medium. It smells dry but it's not. It's really medium and I can really, really taste the pears. I think if this is matured for a good three, four months, it will be absolutely brilliant. Will it last that long? No. Nah. Anyway, I'm going to enjoy this, folks. I hope you've enjoyed the film. I'm sorry about the lost segment. These things happen, unfortunately. But uh, anyway, cheers to you. And I'll catch you on the next film, which is probably going to be a cooking film. But the one after that, hopefully, will be another brew one. Cheers, folks. Good health to you all. And thanks for your support with the channel.
The film that you've just watched is a Moss Home and Garden production. You can find more by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. I'd just like to say thank you very much for supporting my YouTube channel and for watching my films. It really is very much appreciated. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to receive future updates about the home and garden films which I upload. You can find my YouTube channel by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. Please click on the red subscribe button. When you've done that, a little bell will appear. If you press that also, then you'll get future updates about the films which I upload. If you like my films, if you like my style of filming, then you might also like my travel channel, which you will find by going to youtube.com forward slash Stuart Moss or typing www.mosstravel.tv. Again, if you could subscribe to that channel, it would be hugely appreciated. If you'd like to get Moss Home and Garden updates on Facebook, then please open Facebook and do a search for Moss Home and Garden and you will find the page. If you like the page, then you will get future updates on there. And if you'd like to connect on Instagram for home, garden and travel photography, as well as some stories, then my username is Stu Moss, S-T-U-M-O-S-S. If you'd like to connect on Twitter, then my username is at Stuart Moss. And if you'd like to contact me about film usage or any other issue, please just email me on stewmosshomegarden at gmail.com. Once again, thank you very much for supporting my channel, for watching my films. I do appreciate it. I'd just like you all to have a great day.